All right, wonderful people from the Nutrition for Food Technology course, we are moving on to more advanced concepts in our nutrition labeling. And you've been working on the ESHA software and entering some basic recipes. Fantastic. And we're going to be adding on more complexity. One of the things we need to do is determine the serving size of a food uh, package. And um, it's not quite as straightforward as you think, but uh, we'll walk through it um, because once we walk through the logistics of how the Canadian Food Inspection Agency is requiring us to do it, it will make a lot of sense. So at the end of this video, you will be able to identify if your product is a single serving or a multi-serving package. And we'll use the reference serving size tables from the Canadian Food Inspection Agency for identifying your reference serving size. And you'll identify the ideal common terminology for describing your serving size. Because uh, with the new regulations in terms of labeling, you need to label your product with a common uh, serving size that is going to be readily understood by someone who doesn't have a food science background. So again, we are referring to the Guide to Food Labeling for Industry, and all of this guidance is coming from there. And I will share the links in the text section of the of the. Uh, video description so that you can access these websites and follow along with me and look up the content as you're working. So most of our foods need a nutrition facts. Table. Hey, I just noticed this is an old nutrition facts table. Why? Because we've got vitamin A, vitamin C, calcium and iron, and the new, the new update has indicated that it's not calcium and iron, vitamin C, vitamin A, but it's, it's instead potassium that's going to be the essential nutrient. Uh, the government has indicated that vitamin A and vitamin C are nutrients that we um, get sufficiently in the Canadian diet. And therefore, let's focus on potassium, which has a lot of uh, good positive outcomes in terms of cardiovascular disease. Um, but we also note, oh, this is an old table because the serving size is in metric in a form that is not readily understood by uh, end user. They don't have a graduated cylinder to go and measure at 125 mils. The new terminology requests that we use standard household measures or standard uh, easily understood measuring methods. Most people don't have graduated cylinders and scales in their kitchen, despite the fact that they likely should. So uh, you might have remembered before, sometimes it really depends arbitrarily what you decide as a food manufacturer that serving size is going to be. And a lot of that's dependent on how you are going to package your product. We determined before uh, we were doing some uh, um, design of a new recipe and we made some able skivers, a type of uh, Danish pancake donut sort of uh, dish. And I arbitrarily said it's going to be three pieces, therefore it's 84 grams, and that's my serving size. But it's a little bit more complex than that, and we're going to walk through that. So one thing that we will need to do is access this um, this web page, and I'll, I'll, again, I'll share the link with you in the uh, text description for this video, but we're accessing the Canadian Food Inspection Agency's Guide to Food Labeling for Industry, Serving Sizes, and Reference Amounts. And this is uh, what I'm walking through and explaining for you. I'm going to recommend for those of you who are following in this course to take a look, read through it, and get to understand some of the examples that they're describing. So, just to quickly summarize, a serving size on a nutrition facts table or NFT, they need to have a common reference serving size so that consumers can make fair comparisons. Oftentimes those NFTs are part of the shopping experience and a consumer will pick up two packages and they'll say, oh, okay, I am going to eat half a cup of this or half a cup of that. That common reference size means that they can understand and make those side-by-side -side comparisons. When it was using grams or using milliliters, it was harder for consumers to be able to make that abstraction. It was really convenient for um, manufacturers because, yeah, of course, we are uh, weighing things out and we're uh, measuring out the volume in a package and it made logical sense for them. But an NFT is really a tool that's generated by the industry for the purposes of uh, representing the product for sale. And so it's targeted to the consumer. It's not targeted to us, but we have to craft them. So it, uh, 
Something else in an NFT, it helps the consumer understand how many portions should be in a package so that they're not going to go and eat the whole package in one sitting. That said, we'll talk about that more in a moment. Um, they can understand that they should be eating half a package or a quarter of a package or a, uh, one third of the uh, portion of the product that's there. And that aspect of dividing things into halves or quarters is one of the standard measures that's allowed as a common reference serving for consumers. So, as mentioned before, the new formatting requires a household or regular measure first. And this is a clear terminology that's required by the CFIA. You use the household measure first. And so in this case, we've got a product that would be served as uh, something in a volume, and in, in this case, it would be served as per one cup. Most people who have uh, basic kitchens have a set of measuring cups, and they should be able to abstract. This is one cup, pardon me, one cup serving. We do have to have the metric uh, version there because, again, it does link out to our manufacturing standards. So that's always put second and is always put in brackets. Now, one of the key questions, is my package a single portion or a multi-portion product? Well, it really comes down to, does the package contain 200% or less of the reference amount for that food? And if the quantity um, is 200% or less of the reference amount, and I'll show you in a moment the reference tables. This is where the government has gone through and through different um, reference studies and just through uh, common practice, and, and in many cases, decades of common practice of what a normal serving would look like, they have declared this is what a serving is, end of story. And that is what is called the reference serving size. If it's 200% or less, then it's considered something that someone, a normal person could consume in one serving. Or, or, and I'll give some examples in a moment, if it's the sort of product where it would reasonably e be eaten by one person at a single eating occasion, then that is also considered a single portion product. Otherwise, if you've got more than that reference amount or you would consider that product something that you would wrap up and put away a bit in the cupboard or put away in the fridge and eat again at a second eating occasion and routinely do that. Now, I don't mean taking home leftovers or um, feeling full or running out of time to eat your snack, but that you would routinely do that. That would be considered a multi-portion product. Here's one example, and this, this example is very similarly explained in the CFIA's document. So I've got my carton of milk, it's 500 mils. Well, we will jump out to the table in just a moment, but a reference serving for milk is one cup or 250 mils. And so 250 mils is 200% of the reference serving, and therefore this carton of milk at 500 mils would be classed as a single portion of milk. It would also be considered that this carton of milk would be routinely bought as a convenience item and consumed in one full serving. You, I, Yeah, I have had cartons of milk like this and put them back in the fridge, but more commonly these are bought as convenience items at commissaries, at uh, quick service restaurants, and it's consumed as a single portion. Now, how about this? We've got a cookie. And it's one cookie in a pouch. <laughs> I realize that's a, a goofy packaging. It's a mock-up. But I wanted a, uh, just a stock photo that I could use to represent one cookie in one pouch. So it's a cookie. It's 100 grams. That sounds like a good size serving. However, according to the CFIA's reference serving, a cookie serving is 30 grams. And so this is 333% of a reference serving. So... 30 times 3, yeah, yeah, 90, whatever. You've got more than 200% reference serving. Here's the thing. Would you eat half the cookie and then take the half home and put it in the cupboard and eat the second half another day? <laughs> and I'm laughing because I like cookies. I like chocolate. And Honestly, I could never imagine doing that. I would be even more inclined to eat 200 grams of cookie and find a second pouch. You would, it's unrealistic that someone's going to eat half the cookie and then put the second half of the cookie back in the package, wrap up that package and put it back in the cupboard. And that's sort of the, 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 the mental test that you as um, 
manufacturing specialists doing this sort of labeling or for you as a product developer or perhaps you'll get into regulatory this is the sort of decision making that you'd have to do and if if the Canadian Food Inspection Agency were to come and argue with you about your labeling you would have to be able to justify and so this is the mental test that would be out there now how about if we've got cookies in a multi-serve package now if you're like me at some point in time when you've been stressed or whatever you've eaten the whole package but realistically this is now a multi-portion package and you would reseal it and you would put it back in the cupboard and so you would set the portion size closer to the reference serving let's say one of these cookies I realize there's two different types of cookies it was a stock photo of packaging um but let's say each cookie weighs 10 grams you would set that reference serving to be realistic we could, we could argue it's per three cookies at 30 grams, but if you were adamant that it was four cookies, going back to my Abel Skiver example, you can exceed the baseline reference serving, but that said, you'll likely adjust it somewhere uh, well within that less than 200% range. And honestly, this is something that nutrition facts table designers do, is that they'll, they'll tweak those numbers up and down a little bit in terms of on a multi-portion size so that you get the nutrition facts table um, to read as you want. You can tweak that portion size within that reference serving so that you are still compliant with the regulation. Um, and I'm sure you've seen this before too, where a company will um, go up or down a gram on a product just to be able to be able to make a nutrition claim on that product. So. This is a decision-making tree. I actually, I put it in my slideshow to remind me to take a look at it, but let me jump out to the web page. And again, I always joke that we are friends and I'm not going to edit this out because the editing takes a lot of time to do. That's grouping sugars-based ingredients. We'll do that another day. So serving sizes and reference amounts, and let's jump to the decision tree that CFIA had, had built for this. And what's silly is, no matter how big I make the text, that decision tree remains really, 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 really fuzzy. So let me just walk you through what the, what the image says. So first off, you're gonna decide, determine the reference amount using the table of reference amounts. We're gonna to jump to that in just a moment. Is the package less than 200% of the reference amount or is it reasonably consumed by one person in a single eating occasion? Yes, therefore it is a single ingredient or a single serving product and you would declare the entire package. So it would be per package, and then, it, and then you would put the metric weight in brackets, or the metric volume in brackets. And if it is not complying with this 200% of the reference amount, or consumed by a person in one sitting, no, then it is a multiple serving prepackaged product. Then you would go and determine the reference size for what is is realistic, or if it's the sort of thing that, that it comes in set portions, you would you would collect what the the closest portion count would be. So think of the able skivers or the cookies. We we would pick a realistic count that's close to the reference amount, but we wouldn't have to slice things in fractions of pieces necessarily, unless it was routinely done that way. And then you declare it by. Uh, either volume by weight, or not by weight, by a household measure, or by a piece count, or by a fraction. So it, let's say it was a pizza, you could say by one quarter of the pizza. It would be realistic for people to know what one quarter of a pizza is. And then you would put one quarter of the pizza weighs uh, 160 grams. Let's jump out to these reference tables so that we know what we're looking at. So again, this is in the Guide to Food Labeling for, Ad, er, er, for Industry. And I often just look it up by typing in reference amounts for food CFIA into Google. But let's look, uh, I, just, I just mentioned uh, cookies. This table groups things into like. I often will instead do control F. So cookies, cookies, cookies with or without coating or filling, it is 30 grams. So these are bite-sized cookies measurable with a cup. <laughs> how, how many people measure cookies in a cup? I guess that would be like little tiny, tiny cookies, like uh, mini Oreos or mini, mini uh, chocolate chip cookies. And we've got the package of multiple units. 
and then we're doing it by unit piece. But uh, we've got that 30, 30 grams. And so we're going to either make the unit count as close to 30 grams as possible, or we can, if it's tiny bite-sized cookies, we would measure it by a household cup. What else did we talk about? Let's look up pizza. Pizza. So fifth, whoa, pizza crust. Let's see if we can find pizza pizza, not pizza crust. Who eats just pizza crust? That's silly. Burritos, enchiladas, pizza, pizza rolls, sausage rolls. So pizza is, so one serving is going to be 200 grams. And so realistically, now I, I keep thinking of the, the, thin, the thin crust pizza that my, my spouse and I often have for dinner and we'll each eat half of the pizza with some salad. Let's say that pizza was 380 grams would we subdivide it so that we had per one, what would that be? I'm gonna pull up a calculator here. Come on calculator, oh, I already have it open. 380 grams divided by two, 190. So do you have to force it so that your pizza is 200 grams? No, you could say per half a pizza, 190 grams. That would be acceptable because it's well within it's, it's not less than 50% of this portion. You wouldn't want to force it too small a portion either. And so you want to make it realistic so that it is very close to that reference portion, but you don't want to force it too, too small. And so if my pizza weighed 380 grams and I cut it into half, I could make that per, per pieces or per unit per half of the, so fraction of the package is acceptable. For half of the pizza, I can say per 190 grams as the metric por portion of the statement. So my pizza is per half of the pizza, 190 grams in brackets. That's my portion size. So we have walked through some examples. I'm going to give you some more examples in a second slideshow, but you now know how to go through and find in the table of reference amounts for food, what your reference serving size is, and you are able to make appropriate declaration. I wanna walk you through within ESHA how to be able to make those edits so that you have a compliant label going onto your package. So that will be in the next video. You know where to find me if you have questions. I always love to hear from you and I've had some fantastic conversations with different students in the class. And it's always fun to explore and discover new things and Keep on learning together. Take care and we'll talk to you soon.